Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is John Rubino. Thanks for being on the show again, John. Thanks, Whitney. Great to be back. Glad to have you back on the show. John is a returning guest. I would encourage you to look, look his previous episode up and, and you're going to learn a lot about him. He's had some great success in this business and, in this business and uh, is doing some big things. Uh, and so I encourage you just to, to reach out to him, which he'll, I'm sure he'll tell you how to do that in a little bit, but a little more about him in case you haven't heard of him before. He's the COO and founder and co-managing partner of JID Investments, LLC. JID, a real estate private money and equity investment firm, which seeks to secure high yield returns with medium risk by providing investment capital to individuals and businesses with viable residential, commercial, and mixed use real estate uh, business and or investment opportunities. John's primary responsibilities include executing daily operations, including marketing and advertisement, website and social media design, investor and client relations, extensive due diligence, review of all prospective investor and business clients, uh, financial and revenue analysis, and securing uh, of investment source uh, for project funding resulting in investments of over 21 and a quarter million dollars plus revenue growth exceeding 15.9 million uh, for the company. Uh, congratulations, John. Uh, JID Investments has over 14 and a half million invested uh, and or are committed on six current projects, uh, three in Washington, D.C., uh, com uh, combined in North Carolina, South Carolina, hold opportunity and two in Atlanta. Uh, so uh, John is doing big things. And so I hope you are listening closely because I'm looking forward to learning more about how he has done this, how he's grown this business to this scale, uh, just managing that many investments, that many investors. Uh, you don't do that by, by sitting on your hands, uh, you know, or not being professional or not doing this, uh, uh, you know, just uh, quality work. Uh, and so John, uh, welcome back to the show. We're looking forward to getting into this. Uh, any updates you want to provide us? Uh, you know, I know a lot's happened probably since the last time you were on, on the show. It's been a good while but uh you know congratulations again why don't you give us some updates on what's happening and and uh, and let's jump into some specific things you're you know you've done to to grow like this and this how you scaled your business uh you know what 22 projects and uh 21 plus million invested over 100 active investors i mean that's where a lot of the listeners are, are trying to get to right uh and so right. give us an update though before we get there yeah, it's been a great ride. Thanks again for having me back. It's an honor to be here. I enjoyed our, our first time together. And I, I think um, I, I went into more detail from my background and, and how I got started, um, you know, in the Navy, being a 20 year Navy veteran as a pilot and, um, and transitioning over to the business full time in 2017 after starting it part time in 2013. And so, you know, a lot of that was, was great information that I shared in the first episode, but I think we need to get into, you know, what's happened since then. And, and we've had a lot that's happened since then. We've really grown the business. We've gone out and been more active in our community, been more active in the investment world for both funding partners that want to work with us and people that need capital and equity on their projects as well as bringing on new investors that are passive in nature, that, that want to uh, participate and work with us and partner with us as part of our projects and are available anytime to come in and, and see the great deals that we bring forward that we approve for funding. We've brought on some consultants. We have a due diligence consultant now that works with us who does a lot of our due diligence and analysis, demographic reviews, um, looking at a lot of the performance and the offering memorandums. So that's a huge asset to have uh, for our team. And um, we're starting to bring on people now that can help us with introductions to new investors, people that are in their network, people that they know would be uh, benefited by just knowing us and sharing and seeing what we do. So a lot's been happening and um, the, the projects really have grown in scale as well, where we're doing well over, um, you know, millions of dollars worth of project investments. Uh, we were finishing up some very large scale projects that have been four, five, six years in the making. So, you know, COVID has definitely made things a little challenging, extending timelines a bit. But at the same time, we're navigating 
the seas and we're, we're working hard to, to get to the finish line on a lot of these active deals. And we're still growing the business. So again, it goes back to managing what's on your plate, making sure things finish uh, as best as can to your projections and the returns and the timelines, making sure that the overall project is a success for our sponsors, for our company and for our investors, and then looking at new business, what's coming in and, and keeping a cautious eye given the environment right now, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about, but we have not had any problems with new projects, people that are looking for funding, new partners that want to join us, giving the value we can add to them and their companies. And um, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, reviews of these new companies, which is exciting. And these aren't companies I'm going out and looking for. They're coming to us. So that speaks to um, the success we've had, the performance we've had, the, pr uh, the proof of concept we've had. And on the investment side, our investors who have been with us since day one are introducing us to new investors. So organically, we're growing inside the business where we're getting a new investor base. We're at 140 investors right now. I think the last time I spoke to you, we were just over 100. And um, we're growing. We're growing real well and comfortably and not at a pace that uh, makes us kind of get anxious or concerned or nervous. We're doing it at a really nice pace. So that's big picture and uh, it's been a, an exciting ride. Nice. Well, I appreciate that update. There's numerous things there. I want to just us discuss a little bit as, sure. as we go along, uh, but I think it's going to fit well. And just what we're talking about today, I uh, just, you know, I know you contribute, um, you know, a part of a large part of your growth and, and the way you've scaled to just the power of relationships. Right. And, and, you know, exactly. so, you know, can you elaborate on that and maybe us discuss a few of those, maybe key relationships, you don't have to name anybody by name, obviously, but you know, let's talk about, well, how did you meet that individual or did you seek them out and what, you know, what was their role or, or you know, how did they uh, help you to scale your business and what did that relationship look like a little bit? Well, just being a business person in general, um, I think you always have to look at uh, a relationship with how, how do I, what value do I bring? How can I help the person, the group, the business, the people, uh, whoever I'm trying to, to work with and or network with? Um, that's the first thing is the value I bring. The second thing is, is there a direct or indirect connection? Direct being, hey, we could do business together uh, actively, directly to our lines of efforts, our lines of business. Uh, and that's a person that obviously there's there's a lot of work we can do together from what I bring to the table and what that individual or business brings to the table. Or is it an indirect where I may not be able to help that person or they may not be able to help me, but they have three to five other people in their network they can introduce me to and or I can do the same. Uh, my philosophy is I want to do two times more uh, from what I can give than what I can get. And the reason why is that's just who I am. I like to be able to help people. I'm a good connector. Um, I enjoy putting people together and, um, and seeing things come to fruition. And a lot of times I look at that as, hey, that's great for those two people. And if it works out well and they can do business together, then maybe they can open a door for me or maybe they can recognize the, the value I brought to that uh, interaction, that introduction. Um, and so those are two key things. And I'd also say that I'm very transparent with my business. I am uh, willing to share, you know, <laughs> all the secrets of what we do, which really is just really straightforward. And it's, it's open to the public. They can see what we do. They can review our, our documents. They can go through our business perspectives. They can look at our, um, our newsletters, our, our investor pitch decks. This is all available to the, the, the general public. And then on the investor side, um, we want to make sure that our investors are comfortable with us, our process, how we've done, how we've performed before they even sign up to join us as investors. And by doing that, it shows them that I am dedicated and I am willing to do whatever it takes to win over their trust, win over their desire to be part of what we do. And at the same time, when they join us as an investor, there's never a dollar that they have to give to us to be an investor. They're just on board to, to see what we're doing. And uh, they have to sign some non-disclosure agreements because, as you know, there is very sensitive information in the projects we, we, uh, we fund, and we want to make sure that there's a, a level of uh, disclosure between our sponsors and our investors. So that's really the major reason why we want folks to sign up with us to be able to see what we do. But at the same time, transparency is very, very important. The more you're willing to share with folks, the more you're willing to take time to spend with them. I've had meetings, maybe 10 meetings with investors that have joined me 
to make them feel comfortable, to take them out to project sites, to make them feel like we really can, are concerned with their, their, um, their interests, to make sure that they're covered and that they have everything they need to start with us. And then when the projects come to fruition and we start bringing them forward for investment, we're always available. We always answer our phones. We go through that. We provide the details and we make ourselves always available to our investors to answer those questions. Nice. Yeah, you mentioned uh, around 140 investors. Are those, uh, you know, how do you, I guess, have that number? Is, are those active investors or those people who have worked with you uh, on, on some project? Those are investors that have signed up to become JID investment investors who see our information on our website at jidinvestments.com. They go to our overview page of the website. They have the five key documents. They've reviewed those. They've contacted me. We've done some meetings and or they've gone right to our investment services page under our services tab and they've signed up via our accredited investor questionnaire. At that point, we verify, we do some, they do self verification of their accredited investor status. They sign our disclosures, they go through all the information. And once I approve that, they are now on our investor database list. So that at that point, I have their contact information and I can share with them all incoming projects that we review that are in our, pop, our pipeline for funding. Okay. So, you know, talk about that just a little bit or, or sure. uh, you know, about when they, they can go on the website, they fill out the, you know, a self-accreditation, uh, you know, document. Is that something um, that you'll do then and then, then you don't have to do in the future? Or let's say as, as you have a specific deal, do they have to do it again or, or is that, does that take care of it? That's a great question. So our process has changed a bit since the last time you and I spoke. Our accredited investor questionnaire allows an individual to self-accreditate. So they could go in and they could fill out the paperwork and say, I am a, an accredited investor as an individual through net worth, as you know, or income, or I'm an entity, I'm a self-directed IRA, I'm a, a corporation, a partnership, however they, ver however they qualify as an accredited investor. And once they fill out that pa paperwork, that gets them on our list. And when we have a specific deal that they want to invest in, then we will have them actually provide verification. And that could be done through a third party um, verification company, their, their uh, CPA, their attorney, their broker, or they can send us over their financials. We'll review that. We'll make sure that everything is aligned well. And then uh, that would allow them to then invest on a specific opportunity. So we allow them to do that uh, once they want to come in and actually invest money with us on a specific project. As you know, each of our projects are set up as separate entities. We're not a fund. So anytime we have a project, that goes out as a specific ident uh, individual project that the investors will invest on. Um, and they're all treated separately, which is great. Um, are, all your, are all your investments or your projects 506Cs offerings? Uh, the majority actually are 506B. Okay. So that, that's another great reason why we want to bring people on board first so that they're on board with us. They've been, uh, they've been brought on board and now they are part of our network of investors, our investors, so that we can then share project information and again, verify that, that AI status. Now, the SEC gives you very broad guidance here on that and they say that you, know, you can't generally solicit to a pool of non-accredited investors. However, those people are not being generally solicited as the open public. They are JID investors. They have a connection to us. There is engagement, there is a relationship. So we can then share those five or six Bs. Um, and then again, there, there's processes on our accredited investor questionnaire that they can review. So, and I didn't know this, uh, a net worth individual who's accredited has to self uh, has to accreditate every three months in order to get that accredited investor status. Whereas if they're doing it for income, it's every 12 months. So I don't know if your listeners knew that, but every three months, if you're verifying your accredited investor status to participate in a B or a C, it has to be done every three months. Whereas for income, it's every 12 months. I did not know that. Yeah, so you learn something new every day. Wow, I'm <laughs> glad you brought yeah. that up. Yeah, um, and that's so in our paperwork too. Interesting. So that means if they do fill out that initial one, there, there's a chance that numerous of them are, they're going to have to fill it out again if they do yes. an investment, say six months later with you. That's right. If it's net worth. Are, are, right. Uh, are, are you working with accredited investors only? 
No, we do have a, a pool of qualified investors that are non-accredited. Mm -hmm. Those are close friends and family. Those are people we have uh, engagement with. We have a relationship with someone from California who calls me up and says, Hey, I saw your website. I love what you do. I'd like to invest, but I'm not an accredited investor. We can't, we can't do, we can't invest with that individual or that business. But if it's someone local to my area, someone that comes in, I get to meet, I grow a great relationship with, I understand that they're not investing their mortgage or their kids' college funds, that they're investing capital that's available and they're sophisticated and they have an understanding of the risk, then those individuals can fill out a qualified investment disclosure. And as long as you know probably this, on a 506B, you don't have more than 35 non-accredited investors, you're okay to have them participate in a B. Right, right. So- you know, those uh, or that initial form, I wanted to ask you about that again, that like, um, is that mostly just for like documenting your relationship then? Because I, I don't think it's required to have that up front, you know, especially you're, you're going to do that during a deal. Um, but uh, is that mostly just to document the relationship and that you've, you knew that from the beginning and, you know, they engaged with you, things like that? That's correct. I want to be able to go to people that are already on board with us as investors when it's time for an investment, that they have everything they need up front. We do all the prerequisites up front. We share all the information they want to see up front. We take them out to projects up front. They're going to beat me up to make sure they know everything about me up front so that when I bring them on as investors and it's time to look at projects, they've already seen a private placement memorandum. They've already seen one of my deals. They've gone through everything with me. So now that they're in a position to see projects. And that's how we do it on the funding side too, Whitney, is we spend time up front doing our due diligence on these companies that we fund. And that takes time. And we make sure that we are comfortable with them. They're comfortable with us. The worst thing in the world is, is when you get a deal from a new company and they say right away, well, these are the returns and this is the structure and everything is out of whack, right? It's worth spending the time up front to get all of that laid out and make sure we're all on the same page so that when the project comes, there's no miscommunication. There's no misidentification of how things are going to be done because you've done that up front. You've spent the three, two, five, ten months, whatever you feel comfortable with, and got all of your questions answered. You spoke to the bank. You looked at their contractors. You saw the market they're in. You've got proof of concept. You went through a full cycle deal, and you feel good about that business. And they also see the value you bring to the table as a business like us. So you mentioned, uh, you know, investors are now making referrals and, uh, you know, and that's a, that's a great thing, right? You know, I see yeah. some emails like that. Sometimes people make introductions and says this person, you know, would love to know more or invest with you all as well. And it's, it's a great feeling, right? It is. Uh, but, you know, everybody wants that to happen right away. And I feel like it, it takes a little time, right? It takes a few deals and, you know, takes, you know, we want it to happen right away, like everything. But uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? How did those start happening? Did you encourage that or is that in something that, just they started doing on their own. Uh, what did that look like? Well, you know, we started our company unofficially in 2012. We took a full year to get it up and running, get the documents in place. And then we went out to some very trusted people within our network. My business partner, David, who's down in Hilton Head, is an enrolled agent. Like I mentioned last time, I was, his accounting, I was an accounting firm and uh, has a really great network of people, friends down in uh, Hilton Head, and I'm up here in DC, but I also have a great network of friends through the Navy, come from a bitty, pretty big family. So when we started the business, uh, we went out to friends and family first. We went out to those that we trusted the most and who trusted us the most because of the relationship, because they were family and friends. And those are the people we pitched to first because those are the ones that really we felt comf most comfortable with and they felt most comfortable with us so that they could ask us the tough questions and they made us better. They made us a better business. And once they were able to get to a position where they felt comfortable, they said, Hey, we helped you with all this stuff. We don't want to be compensated, but bring us on board as your first investors. And that was our first 10 to 20 investors in the company, which was great. And so those were the folks that were our core foundational investors that worked with us on our first five projects or six projects. And then as proof of concept started to happen and we saw success and we started going out to other friends and family, then we started to network more. Then I started going out to local area real estate investment groups. Then I started talking to public people that I connected with on LinkedIn uh, or referrals or going to uh, real estate investment events like uh, IMN or IMF, uh, Opal group, these different organizations that host 
investors that come out and now I'm networking with public investors. Um, and then you start reaching out to businesses that do this for a living who can connect you with people, family offices, registered investment advisors, uh, brokers who are private placement brokers. These are big boys and girls that go out and, and talk to some really wealthy individuals that may have an interest in what I do. So that's the exciting part. And then I started partnering with preferred equity lenders, other people that do stuff that's similar to me. So, you know, the movie Godfather, Marlon Brando says, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. But <laughs> I don't even consider them my enemies. They're such good friends and we have great business relationships. And so I can now help a sponsor maybe with the full equity deck or stack with $10 million of preferred equity and $2 million of limited partner or general equity for my company to help that sponsor get that full equity stack. So when you, when you say the uh, preferred equity uh, mm -hmm. provider or, you know, wh what does that mean exactly? You yeah. Know, just listening like, okay, now who in the world is that? You know, yeah. what, what is that? So, so in a capital stack, you typically have three layers of funding. You have a debt lender who's your bank or your capital fund or your debt pension group that comes in and funds anywhere from 50 to 75% of your deal. And then you typically can come in with about a five to 15% preferred equity lender who's, usually a private equity group or fund or a pension fund or someone that can cut a check anywhere starting from $10 million and above. And those folks get a lower return than the, the general equity, which is the third group in that list, but a higher return than the bank does. And, and for that return that they get, usually I would say 10 to 12 to 13% a year on their money, they're batting second in the, in the, in the batting order. So after the bank gets paid back, the preferred equity piece gets paid back next. But these are larger groups. They're making a, a little bit less or less than what the private equity groups make. And then the third person batting is me, a general equity or limited partner group that can bring in 100000 to $5 million a project. We'll bat third in the batting order behind the debt lender and the preferred equity. And we can write a smaller check, but get the sponsor over the hump to fund it, to fund the last 10, 5% of the deal. And so that's where we come in. Great. No, a, a great explanation. And I, I just want to say too, the, the risk level also corresponds with the, exactly. with the way you laid that out there, right? And in the Very order in which the distribution or capital is refunded, you know, things like that are also in that same order. That's exactly uh, right. So would you, you know, we just have a few more minutes, but, uh, yeah. uh, but I thought, you know, just your process of onboarding investors, uh, you know, if you could elaborate on that a little bit, you know, because uh, it sounds like, you know, you have some documents that they need to see and deals that they need to look at and they go to your website, you're, you're making them sign some stuff, you know, and I feel like you're, you're creating that, um, uh, really that feeling of like, uh, I belong, right? Or, yes. you know, like, you know, I feel, I feel honored to be a, a JID investor. Right. You know, I'm on his list, you know, which is mm -hmm. that's a great feeling to be able to or be able to create that for your investors. Uh, and just, you know, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Maybe your onboarding process and and, uh, you know, how you how you build that. Yeah. So if you go to our website, I actually I'm a, I'm a pictorial guy as a Navy pilot. I had to see it visually. We have a, a pretty nice schematic of process of how we bring people on board. You know, the the introduction, the the comfort of just meeting us and learning more about us, all that upfront stuff that, that uh, we want to do with a, a new prospective investor. And then it's really going through the documentation, both our company documentation. Uh, we have five key documents on our review page on the website and we go through that. We let them read it. We let them do it on their own time. And then whenever they want to go through any specific um, document or our, um, information that we've shared, we can. And, uh, and it's really at their comfort level when they say, okay, now I'm ready to take the step forward. Now I'm ready to fill out the accredited investor questionnaire. And we walk through that with them as well. And always, we always emphasize that there's never an obligation or requirement to invest with us by becoming an investor. It just puts them in a position to be ready to look at our project documentation. And when we have a project, then we start with the project level information, which is usually a, a project announcement. I put together an eight to 12 page project summary of investments, which comes from my company. And then at the same time, I'm on the phone with my corporate securities attorney in New York to put our private placement memorandum together. So our investors are getting a step-by-step -step breakdown of documentation and information on each specific project. And throughout that whole process, they're asking us questions. They're going through all the information. 
And at that point, we're working together as a team to make sure we answer what they need answered. And if they have some, you know, uh, good, good questions that we have to go back to our sponsor to ask and or ask for more further information, it's all part of that process. So uh, that's the exciting part. Um, and just so you know, we, we have, um, you know, our asset classes really vary. We're not a, a one trick pony where we're only doing ground up new construction development. I mean, we do single family renovation. We do ground up development, new construction. We do multi multifamily value add. Uh, we're getting ready to start our first opportunity zone investment in Washington, D.C. Uh, we do senior assisted. We do student housing. We do storage. So we're doing a very broad spectrum. It's not necessarily asset class that meets the bill. It's really the sponsor, what they do, the market they're in, how comfortable we are with them, and, and whether or not they're willing to, to, to work with us to get us where we need to be on structure returns. And then when they bring it to us on those specific deals, then we'll look at the asset classes. So that's really how we do it. Nice. Nice. So yeah. you mentioned a new upcoming opportunity and you mentioned it was an opportunity zone investment. And I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and put out its 506C offering, meaning yep. we, can, we can discuss it. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but opportunity zone investment, it's been a little while since anyone has brought that up on the show and kind of what that means. Could you just tell us kind of briefly what, you know, what is yes. an opportunity zone investment? The 30 seconds on the Opportunity Zone investment is in 2017, uh, Senator Tim Scott and Senator Cory Booker up in New Jersey came together. It was a bipartisan piece of the 2017 uh, Jobs Act, and it basically empowered uh, investors to come in and invest in areas that were identified by governors of each of the 50 states in D.C., to, to identify uh, locations, typically urban, revitalized, regentrified, affordable areas to invest. And what it, the, incentive, the incentivized piece there was that individuals could take tax deferred gains and roll them in to these investments. And uh, over a 10 year period or more, any of the profits that were earned on those tax deferred gains would be tax free. So if you brought in $100,000 of tax deferred gains, after 10 years, if you earned another 100 on the 100,000 you brought in, the 100,000 you earned would be tax free. And so that was the incentive. And they also had an incentive of treating that tax deferred investment where over certain periods within the timeline, you would get a reduction in basis on the tax you would have to pay. And it would push out the date on when you would have to pay that gain throughout the timeline of the actual opportunity zone investment. So in the past, if you liquidated this year, let's say on a property, you'd have to pay your capital gains tax in 2000, for 2020, either quarterly or in 2021. For this, for this opportunity, you get up to six years. The first six years of the investment in the opportunity zone is deferred. So you're not paying any taxes on that gain until year six for tax year six and you're getting 10% of your basis knocked off at year five. So you're actually now only paying, in that example I gave you, taxes on 90,000 for the year six in year seven. So it's a reduction in 10% basis. So that's pretty nice. And um, there's other things in there, like you get to write off double depreciation. Uh, there's, there's so many great incentives in there. And so we're getting ready to raise $10 million for, an opportunity for, for two projects that are wrapped in potentially four in Washington, D.C., and it's with a sponsor we're actually investing with right now. And the tax-free returns probably a range between 12 to 13% a year return on investment. And uh, it's a great opportunity because you don't have to pay taxes on that once we exit the pro project in year 10 or 11. Nice. You know, you uh, um, were talking about this deal, and then earlier you had mentioned like having a cautious eye due to the current market. Uh, maybe you can, could you elaborate a little bit on, you know, how you're having a cautious eye on the market right now? You can talk about that current deal or not either way. Yeah. You know, and kind of give us an example. So big picture, we all know what COVID's done. We know that um, there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. Uh, I've listened to people like Sam Zell, and I've listened to people like Warren Buffett, and I've read, and, and, and no matter what I see, it's on both opposite ends of the spectrum. It's a V recovery. It's a U recovery. It's an L recovery. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And so um, the, 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 the good position we're in is that, you know, we're getting through our projects. We're still going to hit our projections within one to 2% of our returns. 
but we're very cautious in, in where we want to invest. And we feel DC is a great location because uh, it's one of those markets that is well absorbed through population, jobs, uh, Amazon, HQ2 is coming, the government, well, it's here, I should say, the, the government is, is only growing. So we really look at those markets that uh, are showing great uh, ability to absorb the risk as well as be on the cusp of the return when the market does rebound and we see growth. So those market, the markets are number two on my list is I always look at that market with a, with a keen eye. Number one is my, my sponsors. So the sponsors and the market are hand in hand. And um, so we, we love markets like Washington, DC, Atlanta, Georgia, um, you know, North Carolina, South. We like that East coast because it brings a quality of life, a lower cost of living, um, it brings higher populations and we like those markets. We've invested in those markets. Now there is some speculation that people may be going more out to the suburbs in the future, but at the same time, we still believe in those, those markets we're in. And, uh, and that's the mindset we're going to take when we look at these markets, when we kind of have that cautious eye of, uh, how they perform. John, what's a way that you've recently improved your business that we could apply to our business? Yeah, I think uh, just going back and seeing what's worked and, uh, and, and, and just kind of growing that, you know, whether it's, hey, I've done really well finding investors through this, um, but not so much through this. So how do I either improve that or take it off of my, my way of, of finding investors and focusing more on ways of doing it like this? So just going back and doing some housekeeping and making sure that uh, the things we're doing that are working well, we focus on and take those things that maybe aren't performing as well, bring in someone that can help us optimize or make it more ideal, or just take it off and say, you know what, that's probably not something that's going to work for us in the future. Well, speaking of that, what's been your or your current best source of meeting new investors? Going back to my current list of investors, and then I've started a list of people that can introduce me to people that I want to bring on as investors. So it's kind of like I have my little army now of people that are wonderful people that can go out and help us meet new investors, bring on new investors. And, um, you know, we help them with referrals to help their business, or we find ways to make it mutually beneficial for them that it, it makes sense. And so that's ways we can do business together where they're incentivized to go out and introduce us to new people. Um, LinkedIn is still a great source, but, uh, but really following up on the lead you get and making them feel like, Hey, I'd love to have you on board. You know, if you don't hear from them for a week or two, you know, what can I do to make it more comfortable for you? And if they say, Hey, we're not interested, no problem. I say, I wish you all the best. I'm here if you want to talk more. And if there's anybody in my network that can help you, with your business, again, going back to that indirect connection on the networking right. and the relationship, that's how we do it. Number one thing that's contributed to your success? My personality and just the way that I treat people. Um, we, we said this before. I think you asked me on the last episode, what was my favorite book? One of my top threes is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And just showing a genuine care for other people, seeing them succeed and feeling good about it, being a Christian and saying that I love to see other people succeed. And I think when you show that and you care about people in that way, whether it's a JID investor or a mortgage broker I work with or a realtor I work with, if they're succeeding, you're succeeding because in the grand scheme of things, they're making our business better. And at the same time, they see who I am. So they see that I'm a, a genuine person that really cares about. Them. How do you like to give back? I know you probably, you just yeah, talked about a lot of giving I just talked about if, that. If there's any other way you want to highlight, that'd be great. Balancing my life with my family, but at the same time, really doing what, what it's all about. And it's just uh, taking care of my community, going out and helping people that are less fortunate. Um, people who are getting started in our business who, who need some coaching or mentoring you know, free of charge. I'm happy to talk to people anytime that I can help shape and, and get them on their path. I think that it's so important to help people that uh, are, are genuine and that you can help. And um, they don't see dollar signs or you don't see dollar signs in their eyes. You see a person that has great potential. 
Great. Well, John, great show. I appreciate you just coming on and providing so much value, uh, you know, every time and and just going through your process. Most of the listeners I know are are just dreaming about being in your shoes and, uh, you know, having the level of success that you've had. Uh, But, you know, tell them how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Listen, I, I love to talk to people. If anybody wants to learn more about this, I talk about it. I, I, I go to groups and I provide um, presentations on how to raise capital and how to talk to people and how to get yourself set up for success in this business of syndication. Um, the best way to get a hold of me is on my website. It's just uh, www.jidinvestments.com. I'm on LinkedIn, John Rubino, or email me anytime at my first initial J, my last name, Rubino, R U. B as in boy, I-N-O, at jidinvestments.com. We have a YouTube channel as well where I put some of my greatest podcasts with people like Whitney Sewell on there. And um, I've gotten nothing but compliments from the one we've done. So I'm excited about this one because I've gotten so many hits and people complimenting me on how you run the show and um, the information and the questions you ask are, are fantastic. So I appreciate that. But that's probably the best ways for folks to get in touch. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.